What the fuck's up, everyone? This is Lamo. First thing I want to talk about is why Curtis Blades always gets right there and then loses a fight that he shouldn't lose. Uh, I got that pick wrong. I'm sure a lot of us did. Curse us for picking the technically better fighter who's also a good athlete in a division like heavyweight where Derek Lewis can just kind of like hack MMA and do whatever he wants, I guess. In some cases, you know, sometimes he'll get finished by a post-prime Mark Hunt. Sometimes he'll knock out Curtis Blades, who, in my opinion, even though he was unconscious, is a better fighter than Derek Lewis. I really just think that Blades' loss comes down to a brain fart because the uppercut and the knee are the two biggest counters to a takedown attempt. Striking counters to a takedown. That's what everyone goes for. It's, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, your strike is coming upwards in a linear path. You're going to meet someone who is diving down. It increases the force. And it's just the most appropriate strike that you can throw if you're wanting to hit someone and punish someone for trying to take you down. These are things that have been around in MMA since the beginning, honestly. And Curtis Blades just decided to shoot a takedown with no setup. And, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say, oh, why did he do that? But, you know, he probably felt, since he was clearly out striking Derek, that he could get away with the sloppy attempt. And one mistake cost him a potential title shot. Now we have to watch Derek Lewis fight for the title. I don't want to see that. Personally, I just don't want to see it because something's going to happen. Derek Lewis got a crazy knockout. Everyone's riding on this wave. And then he is going to fight someone even higher level, and lose badly. Or he might not even fight someone higher level and still lose badly. And then we're all going to talk about how he sucks again. But I don't really think that he sucks. I don't think you can be in the position that he's at if you suck. I don't think that's possible. So like Derek Lewis, I think that he's better. He's got better instincts for fighting. He's like Brian Ortega in the fact that he has really good reactions to when someone is trying to pressure and trying to attack him. He's also a tremendous athlete. So what I see when I see Derek Lewis fight is someone who's a great athlete who's actually possessing good fight IQ. Now due to his technical limitations, he can't really expand upon that fight IQ. Like he's not gonna be able to understand his uh, stance matchup, and start throwing appropriate kicks or trying to pressure someone and hurting them into strikes. He's not gonna do anything like that in terms of fight IQ. Like understanding what advantages you have and knowing how to press them but he understands where he's at in a fight and he knows when he needs to get after it he knows when he needs to counter and he knows when to explode so everything considered Derek Lewis isn't a bad fighter I would say that he's probably just a bad technical fighter but hey fighting's not all about technique as much as of a technique nerd as I am and as much as I really value fighters with a lot of technique there comes a point where you have to realize that it's not all about technique. Fighting just isn't. And that's probably why the casual fan base has such a hard time understanding. Like, perfect example recently would be Israel Adesanya versus Paulo Costa. The casual fans saw Paulo Costa. You see this big, roided up monster who's huge for the middleweight division. And he's just walking people down and throwing body shots and hitting them in the head. Like, Yoel Romero of all people. He's doing that to Yoel Romero. So people see that and they go, well, is he skinny, right? Didn't he weigh at 183? And then they think, okay, well, the physical advantage, the guy's bigger, so he should be able to win. And guys like Derek Lewis kind of reinforce that misguided thinking. But overall, I'm still going to value technique over uh, raw athleticism, of course. I feel like that that's been proven repeatedly. That technique, superior technique usually wins out at the highest levels of the sport usually does now heavyweight and especially uh, mixed martial arts heavyweight division they are undeveloped to the point to where things like that can happen more often than not but I do think that the heavyweight division will reach a point to where guys like even guys like Francis Naganu, as scary as he is that they probably wouldn't be as viable in the future and I can't wait for that future too so props to Derek Lewis. I do think that he's underrated in terms of what he's able to do in a fight, even if he's not the most technically proficient. So the next thing I think we should move to is the main event coming up this uh, this weekend. Cyril Gaon versus 
Rosenstruck, and I just think that that's good matchmaking for the time being. Uh, you get two strikers. It's going to be a good main event, I feel like. Watching two, you know, technically proficient heavyweight strikers is always a fun time for me. I feel like if anyone's going to grapple, it's going to be Cyril just because he's shown a more well-rounded game up to this point. If Rosenstruck closes as an underdog, I think that's a really good bet. Now, I'm not saying that I'm picking him to win, but I think it's a really good bet if he's an underdog because Rosenstruck has a really powerful jab. He understands how to counter. I mean, if Francis Ngannou wasn't, uh, you know, an indestructible tank, he really did get countered like three times on his way to knocking out Rosenstruck. He got countered repeatedly. So, so the potential for Gon to get caught whenever he is trying to set up his offense is really there because Cyril doesn't have his feet under him a lot of the time. Uh, you know, I think maybe that's just because he's more uncomfortable using the hands than he is using his kicks. And he's a fantastic kicker, so I would not blame him for that. But I do think that the opportunities are there for him to get knocked out and the hype train to get derailed. I'm not sure who I'm going to pick. Uh... I only make prediction videos for uh, pay-per-views for the UFC. I don't I do not do the fight night cards just simply because it takes too much time. I don't, don't feel like doing that. But uh, So I'm not going to make a video on picks for this. But as of now, I really want Siragon to win, man. I want this guy to be great because he has the athleticism that we want in the heavyweight division. That's the, the type of athleticism that boxing fans have been used to for 30, 40, 50 years. We don't get that as MMA fans. The closest thing we ever got to that is Brock Lesnar, who's a, a science experiment, who came in and made a mockery of MMA. Honestly, oh, he's got three fights and he's going to fight for the belt? Oh, <laughs> cool, man. Totally legitimate sport. You could totally fight professionally in boxing three times and go fight Anthony Joshua. No, you can't do that because boxing is more developed. And MMA has always been in this corner. And, and I feel like Cyril Gaon and guys like him, they really... They really usher in a new era of higher weight MMA like the sports getting more developed better athletes are choosing MMA as their source of income as their sor as their career and that's so cool like I can't imagine where the sports gonna be in 20 30 years like as great as we think Stipe Miocic is in 20 to 30 years his skill set and his like athleticism might be obsolete compared to the people that we have in the future as the sport gets better, as more athletes come in, that's that's why a lot of people, you know, they get upset whenever I try to tell them that lower weights are more developed. Like, it's not John Jones' fault that he fought guys who were smaller than him all the time. It's not his fault. He fought whoever they put in front of him, and I guarantee you he would have fought whoever they put in front of him, regardless of how big his opponents were. But, light heavyweight and heavyweight divisions, the upper weight divisions, just don't have the kind of athletes. They just don't have the kind of athletes that the lower weight divisions do. Like, if Chad Mendez was 6'5", he'd be in the NFL. That's the kind of athleticism that he has. But he's not. He's small, so the only thing that he can do is really just combat sports. And that's just the nature of the game. So I'm really hoping that Cyril gets it done. I really am. I really want this guy to be it. I want him to be a star. I want him to win. So there's a little bit of bias there. And, and to be honest, I haven't really studied most of their fights. I watched a little Rosenstruck last night just to get a refresher on what he's done. And, you know, Francis Ngannou knocking him out kind of, like, took some of the luster off of him. But he's a really, he's got a lot of power, and he knows how to counter. Like, he doesn't just, like, swing wildly and connect and kill you like Ngannou does. He actually counters you and kills you. And that's what, it requires more skill, and I really appreciate that. So, I think that if Rosenstruck closes as an underdog, that's a very, very good bet. And then, in the co-main event, we got Magomed Ankalaev. And, dude, I am so excited for this guy. It's the same thing with Cyril Gaon. Like, I am so excited for Ankalaev. I think he's the best, currently the best light heavyweight in the world. And I know that's you probably like, oh, that's uh, that's ludicrous. Obviously, the best light heavyweight in the world is Jan Blackovitz or John Jones. Like, I don't I don't care about those guys, really. I think that Ankalaev is just the champ in waiting. Uh, his career was held back for about a year for a pointless rivalry. Ion Kutalaba and like he was just so much better than Kutalaba off the rip and everyone thought everyone thought oh, early stoppage it wasn't an early stop I mean okay it might have been a, a little early stoppage but if you watch the fight like Ion got countered 20 times and then he just spammed head kicks and he had no answer for it he had no answer for it he was clearly better than this guy clearly better 
and everyone wanted to act like it was a legit rivalry. Like either guy could be a top top ten fighter. Like no man, there's one guy who's clearly a top ten fighter, and that is Ankalaev. And he destroyed him in the rematch, just like I thought he would, because he's way better than him. And if they fight a hundred times, he's gonna win over ninety. Of them. And I'm just really excited to see this guy fight again. I, I want to see him fight a top five opponent because I feel like. Like, light heavyweight is one of those divisions to where, like, you could fight in the top five and it's not really a big jump from fighting in the top ten. Like, if he got to fight Tiago Santos or Anthony Smith, I mean, Jesus, it's literally like fighting an, an unranked opponent or something. Like, Well, maybe, more respect to Santos on that, maybe fighting Santos is like fighting a top 15 opponent. But fighting Anthony Smith is for sure fighting like a, an unranked opponent. So there really is no difference. I'm just waiting for him to get his shot and... For him to get a shot, he actually has a dangerous fight. Uh, Krylov is a really entertaining fighter. Uh, one of my favorite mixed martial artists to watch in higher weight. Just because he likes to do everything and he's kind of proficient at everything. Uh, he's not the best athlete. Where Ekolaev is a good athlete. So I, I think that in combination with the athleticism and the technical uh, advantage, I think Ekolaev should, should lay him to waste. But, you know, it's MMA. It could be wrong. Uh, I think that if uh, Krylov tries to mix it up, I think he's going to get out-wrestled. I think Ekolaev is too big and too technical for that. Uh, and whenever they get on the feet, uh, Ekolaev just has a lot more setups. And it's just going to be... I don't know if it'll be particularly competitive. But I hope it is. I think that it's going to be exciting for as long as it lasts. And, you know, as much as I like to rag on heavyweight and light heavyweight, like, this is a cool heavyweight and co... Heavyweight main event and co-main event really really cool and i'm excited for it so i uh, now i think it's best to move on to a topic i really don't want to talk about but I, I i do want to talk about in a way um so i saw a video of israel adesanya chew up food and spit it in his dog's mouth and i, I just have to say that for the first time since his arrival in the ufc i totally understand why most people would want him to get knocked out because that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life, man. Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? What are you doing, man? Like, I watched that physically cringed and got a little angry. Like, not angry in like an animal abuse kind of way. I don't think it's animal abuse, really. I'm, sh you know, dogs as primal as they are, he probably enjoyed it, honestly. But it's still just like, why the fuck would you ever do something like that? What is going on man i know he was acting like a bird and that's what birds do is they chew up their food but you ain't gotta do that to your dog man so now if jan knocks him out it'll be okay and i feel like it'll be okay solely because of that video solely because of that video like i will have no problem with the jones fight being ruined i'll just be like hey you know he deserved it he fucking spit up food and fed it to his dog like some freak man what's going on I respect the dude as a fighter, definitely, and like, I actually don't hate him. Like a lot of a lot of my listeners do hate him, but I just like, I mean, you see that, and there is no defending it. There is no, well, that's okay because, like, no, it's not okay, man. It's not okay. It's fucking stupid. It's disgusting. I just wanted to rant on that for a little bit because I was horrified when I saw that video. And if Jan knocks him out, you know, you can't blame people for being happy about it. You can't blame people because when you see things like that, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's fucking disgusting. So I get it. Another fight that I'm really excited about on the card tomorrow is Pedro Mujos versus Jimmy Rivera. Uh, it looks like Rivera right now is the favorite. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that, but also I do see why he could be the favorite. He's better in the pocket. He's got great defensive wrestling. And, you know, it's possible that if he can draw Pedro into those kinds of exchanges that he had with Cody Garbrandt, that he could really win those. Because I know Cody Garbrandt, ever since he beat Dominic Cruz, is supposed to be the, the slickest, fastest, coolest boxer in, in MMA or whatever people like to assign him. But I think Jimmy Rivera is honestly better in the pocket, more technically sound, more defensively aware, has better reactions. He might not be as fast as Cody Garbrandt, but I think that he's an all-around better pocket fighter. So if he can draw Pedro in those kinds of exchanges, mitigate the leg kicks that I know Pedro is going to throw at him, then he can win this fight pretty handily, I think. But this fight, the reason it intrigues me so much is that I think this fight is going to be what I like to call a film fight. And what I mean by film is that 
hardcore MMA nerds and technique nerds like me and other people, we love to watch film whenever we're trying to study for a fight. So, like, I want to go back and watch Pedro Mujos, uh, his last three, four fights. And I'm going to really, really watch them. I'm going to watch them in depth. I'm going to rewind at points. Even if I have to, I don't have to do this a lot, but sometimes you slow down the footage. You're trying to really look for reactions because there's a lot of uh, subtle things that we don't, no one can tell in real time. And uh, whenever I'm going to revisit, you know, Pedro Mujos or Jimmy Rivera in the future, trying to predict their future matchups, I know for a fact, well, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty confident <laughs> that Pedro Mujos and Jimmy Rivera is a fight that's going to provide a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight on both of these guys, because I feel like it's going to be a, an extended battle. Now, that all could be horseshit and someone get knocked out in 20 seconds, but for the time being, I think this is a really important fight. Just to understand both guys, and like, I, I'm really excited for it. Like, it, to me, honestly, it's probably the main event in terms of quality. Like, I'm more excited, you know, potential wise for Cyril Gaon or Ankalev, but in terms of quality MMA, Pedro Mujos and Jimmy Rivera is probably the best fight on the card. I really can't think of anything else I want to talk about. So, I'm going to move on to the Discord question. So, if you're part of the Discord, there is a text channel that everyone is allowed to post into and you can ask questions for the podcast that I will sort through and answer. It doesn't mean I will answer your question, but it is nice to have a pool of questions to pick from. Uh, I did YouTube last time, but I feel like having the Discord you know, rewards the guys for actually making it a community. By the way, I love you guys. Even the people who came in and troll and, you know be mean and stuff I, I even appreciate you guys because more activity is good so um yeah i'm gonna move to the podcast question segment and the very first question that was asked says what do you think connor does from here and what would you like him to do or think is the right move for him going forward well see what i want from connor and if i could control connor as if he was an android that i designed i would make him just be a lightweight contender that sounds like the coolest thing in the world. No super mega expectations on Conor McGregor where he needs to fight for a title or he needs to fight in a top three fight, a number one contender fight. He needs to be up there. I understand he's the biggest star in MMA. I get that. I would prefer for that to be put aside. Still keep him in main events because of it. Like his, All of his contender fights can be main events. That's fine. People are going to buy him anyway. So just let him be a lightweight contender again. Like, just let him be a contender on the rise in the ranks. Reinventing himself, you know, learning, climbing back up to the top. Because I know we have this expectation of Connor because of what he was at his very, very peak. Whenever he first came and hit the scene and what he did to the featherweight division, we all think that that's what he needs to be for the rest of his MMA career. But that's not true. He's in a different division. The sport has evolved. Just let him be a contender. Just let him be a contender. Let him fight someone in the top ten. Just someone random. Just give him a fight. Let him win if he wins. And then start moving him up like a normal contender. Let him fight like two or three times. Like, I know that sounds crazy because he's Conor McGregor. But, I mean, he's just a person. And he just got knocked the fuck out by Dustin Poirier. So, he's not like the champion. So, I think that that's what I want. I want him to just start fighting people. I want him to just start fighting people in the top ten. Get a win streak going. Be a contender again. That's what I want. Do you think Cody Garbrandt can win the 135 title again? No. Do not. Do not see that happening ever. Uh, I don't think Cody Garbrandt would win the flyweight title either. It's like, if you watch his most recent fight with the Sun Sal, it, it's, it's a great knockout. Don't get me wrong. He swings from the hip and knocks him out. It's meme. It's awesome. I mean, it, it's cool. Like, when I watched it, I was like, oh, shit. And I'm sure we all were. But it's not... He just didn't look like he didn't look like a world beater to me. He looked pretty evenly matched with his opponent until until he knocked him out. So I don't think that Garbrandt's on that level anymore, and I, I think it's so not because of his own fault. I think it's solely because the division has progressed so much with guys like Jan and uh, Sterling. Like they have developed such uh, nuanced games and such complex games that I don't feel like Garbrandt like just being a good defensive wrestler and a quick striker. I don't think that's enough anymore. Do you think Stipe versus Naganu is going to be any different from the first one? And if so, in what way? 
Uh, I definitely think it's going to be different. I don't think that Naganu is going to run after him. Uh, the first fight, he literally, he literally did what everyone thinks like a guy that size should do. You just run at a guy and swing and hope, you know, like just constantly pressure, constantly swing. That's what he tried to do. He tried to just take his head off, you know, because, I mean, if you're walking forward and throwing punches, there is a chance you're going to land. And if Naganu lands, then it's terrible. So he tried that against uh, Stipe the first time, gassed himself out, and lost pretty clearly. So I think he's learned from his mistakes, and I think he's definitely going to be different and more patient. I don't know what kind of results that will yield. I have no idea. Everything that I've seen from Naganu, and he, he doesn't fight for long because he, he kills people. But everything I see from Nagano, he rarely sets things up. Uh, he start, he kicked. Like, against JDS, he kicked a lot more. And that's something that you want to see from a mixed martial artist. Like, nagano has got crazy power in his hands, but what if he starts landing kicks? What if he starts learning how to set up kicks? I mean, he can't beat the guy, right? So, I was excited to see him kicking against Junior Dos Santos, who probably had a technical boxing event, who definitely had a technical boxing advantage. And... But all of the kicks weren't set up. They were just naked kicks. So the idea is there. Wherever he's training at, whatever gym, the idea is there. It's like, hey, we need to kick more in this fight because, you know, your opponent has a technical edge here. And then you can you know, open up with punches sometimes. But none of the nuances there, none of the setups, nothing. No feints, just always throwing naked kicks, not throwing kicks at the end of combinations, not opening up combinations with kicks, nothing. Just throwing naked kicks. But I don't know what he's going to do in open space with Stipe because I know he's going to fight him there. I know he's going to be more patient and pick his shots. So what's he going to do? Is he going to have any setups? Is he going to see things, that, like do things that we haven't seen before? You can't just assume he will. But it might be the sad reality that as good as Stipe is, a Nuganu who is patient and just looks for the big shot the whole time is enough to beat him because Nuganu is such a freak athlete. Like, so, like, Nuganu has crazy knockout power for the heavyweight division. Like, everyone knows heavyweights hit hard, but Nuganu hits different. So, maybe being patient, because it's not like Stipe's, you know, Floyd Mayweather in there. He's not Muhammad Ali. He still gets hit. He's got good fundamentals, but he's not the perfect boxer, as you would expect for someone who trains in MMA. So, it's totally possible for Nuganu to hit him. So, if he's a bit more patient, maybe he could find a cleaner shot and put him out. And with Stipe being almost 40... And his durability going down with each fight. I mean, he went through hell in the trilogy with DC. He went through hell. Took a lot of fucking damage. And maybe that's what's put him over the edge. Like, I hope so bad. Because I know is a better fighter than Nagano. I know it. Like, even now. Uh, Nagano's a better athlete than Stipe. Probably. But Stipe's a very good athlete. And I know he's a, such a, a more technical fighter. But Nagano has that kind of power to where... He negates any sort of technical advantage. People say that he is MMA's Deontay Wilder. And it's honestly kind of true. Even though Wilder is more skilled at boxing. Than I would say Nagano is skilled at MMA. It's just that. You know. Different requirements. Like boxing heavyweight just has better athletes. And you know is more developed. Has been around forever. MMA just isn't on that level yet. What's next for 155? Dustin seems more interested in a Connor rematch than the bell. Charles and Chandler are fighting for the title immediately. Connor isn't getting a title shot soon. Tony and Hooker on a skid, etc. That's a lot of good detail with your question, but I can't answer it because I don't know what's next for 155. I could tell you what I want to see, which would be uh, Dustin Poirier and Charles Oliveira for the belt. They can fight for the belt. And then Conor McGregor and Tony Ferguson can fight for relevancy. <laughs> and uh, then Michael Chandler and Justin Gaethje can fight for number one contendership, which would also be just a, a banger fucking fight. But in terms of like what they're actually going to do, I have no idea. So it's up in the air. What was the downfall of Tony Ferguson? Him firing his jiu-jitsu coach and not committing to a real camp? Do you consider him an elite fighter? Uh, I think the downfall of Tony Ferguson is that his style uh, sacrificed, you know, good technical fundamentals for being chaotic and maximized his athleticism and durability. So, like, Tony in his prime was an unstoppable monster athletically. Like, dude's a special athlete. Like, he can, his pace is insane. His durability is insane. A very special fighter in his prime. And, uh, 
you know, but he never really had the deepest technical game, especially defensively. Uh, he's good at rolling with shots, you know, and he, he understands what he needs to do while pressuring, but he pressures in straight lines. Uh, he never really cuts the cage too often. A lot of times, you know, he'll commit to an attack and you'll see him having to turn completely around because his opponent easily circled out. That happens a lot in Tony fights. Now that his athleticism and durability has gone away because he's in his mid-30s as, you know, normal humans start to decline athletically there, I think that his uh, technical deficiencies in his style are more glaring now and there's no athleticism and no uh, extra durability to bail him out of it. I just, I think that, you know, in his prime, his style maximizes athleticism. His athleticism has declined and therefore his overall status as a fighter has declined. A good example to the contrary would be uh, Jose Aldo. He has such good fundamentals that even though he's past his prime, like he's nowhere near the athlete he was when he was 28. And even though that he's past his physical prime, he has insane fundamentals and is able to compete at the highest levels of the most competitive division in the sport which is bantamweight i don't think that tony had that same sort of fundamental uh prowess that aldo has so therefore he's not aging as well so no i don't consider him to be an elite fighter right now unfortunately but i do love tony ferguson as a fighter of all the contenders in any weight class who do you think will most likely be a champ I think Cyril Gon could be champ at heavyweight if he makes all the right decisions. Uh, I hope you're right, but the person I think will surely be champ at some point is Magomed Ekalev. I think that he will be the light heavyweight champ at some point. Whether he's a dominant champ, I have no idea, but I think he will win the belt. I think he's too good not to. Does Kamaru Usman have the chance of being the welterweight GOAT? Yes, I think of course he does, because I feel like he's already fought better competition than GSP did, but he doesn't have the quantity. So he racks up like three or four more defenses, which is totally possible. Uh, I think he's going to be neck and neck with GSP. Regard I know people won't want to admit it. You know, I feel like he'll have to break GSP's welterweight record for people to admit it. Because I feel like that's just a, you know, a number that people can latch on to. But if you're looking at quality of competition and stuff, I don't think he necessarily needs to break his title defense number or anything like that. I think that he can... Just keep fighting and win a couple more fights. And, you know, it'll be pretty even. Like, Usman's dominant, and he's great. So, I would favor Usman over uh, GSP if they fought. Despite Volkanovski being one of the best fighters in MMA, after seeing Ortega's last performance, do you give him a realistic chance of winning their bout? And if so, considering Volkanovski's skills, which path to victory should Ortega follow to maximize his chances? That is a great question, and that's the type of question that I love to read honestly uh i will give ortega a realistic chance of winning um as in i don't think that it'll be a complete wash because i feel like ortega will cause enough problems throughout the fight because i do know that we know that ortega can fight uh five rounds or you know he doesn't seem to have terrible cardio so i feel like he should be comfortable at least a little bit in the the later rounds if we get there but I think that he's so good on the counter with his instincts that he can just make fights a fight, regardless if he's being if he's being outstruck or whatever. I just feel like he's always there. So I'll say that he has a realistic chance of winning the fight, yes. But Volkanovski is likely just going to shut him out for the most part. That's just that's just how I see the fight going. I I'll say, to answer your question, I'll say yes, there is a realistic chance, but I still favor Volkanovski heavily. To win that fight. Does Izzy submit himself as the greatest to ever do it if he becomes double champ then beats John Jones? Uh, I think he instantly shoots into the top 10 without debate but I would like I, he needs to win the heavyweight belt for me to think that he has a goat argument like the greatest to ever do it like he needs to beat Jan beat Jones then beat whoever the heavyweight champion is maybe defend it and then boom wow this guy, three-weight world champion in the highest weight divisions of the sport. Like, that's automatically a GOAT candidate argument. Even if you don't agree with it, which I don't think I'd agree with it. I still think that maybe what uh, Aldo and uh, DJ have done, like, with all of their title defenses and all, you know, like, I feel like that is something that could be valued more than Izzy just getting belt after belt. I understand that. But I don't feel like you could argue that he doesn't have an argument for it if he won three belts. At the in the highest weight divisions, like they're 
obviously they're not as developed as lower weight divisions, but it's still like, you know, no one thinks that Izzy's going to win the heavyweight belt. They think that he's too small. So if he's his technical game is so good that he's able to win the belt at heavyweight, then I mean, he's automatically an all-time great fighter. What is your favorite striking technique? And why is it spamming right overhands until you land one? <laughs> I actually do enjoy throwing an overhand. It's fun. Like, it just, it feels fun. But my favorite strike is definitely left roundhouse to the body. That is my favorite thing to throw. It doesn't matter if I'm throwing it on a heavy bag or a sparring partner. It feels awesome. And the last question I'm going to answer says, The featherweight division is stacked from head to toe with elite contenders, yet it doesn't get shine or blockbuster status that lightweight gets. Why do you think that is? My reasoning is that featherweights don't really talk or promote like lightweights do, and there are less personalities at 145. I mean, those are good thoughts. I mean, definitely a valid theory. Uh, because at lightweight, you have Conor McGregor. So as soon as you have that, just I feel like that answers the question, really. You have Conor McGregor, which brings a crazy amount of eyes and brings that blockbuster status to the division. That's just what Conor McGregor does. And then... From Habib beating Conor McGregor and being the cool... See, Habib and Nate Diaz are two personalities that MMA fans knew about, knew were hilarious. But then when they fight Conor, the casual, casual people... I'm not talking about just MMA casuals. Not just people who like watch MMA and but don't know a lot about it. I'm talking about people who don't watch MMA unless there's this massive fight going on. And those people see Habib and think, oh, that dude's fucking cool as shit. Or Nate Diaz, that dude's cool as shit. It brings more status. It brings the division uh, more blockbuster, like you said. And I really, really do think that that is just the Conor McGregor effect, like, in comparison. So, yeah, I'm done here. So, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, The first podcast that I put up since the channel has blown up uh, had a lot of positive feedback. And I really appreciate you guys listening to what I have to say. And uh, whether you agree or not. So, yeah you guys take it easy and i'll be back next week and leave some questions in the comments and i'll probably look through them and answer those as well because i i just like answering questions it's fun so yeah take it easy guys